Good evening, church, and good evening to those that are listening on Facebook and those that are listening on the internet. Let's open with a word of prayer tonight. Father God, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And we lift up the name of Jesus because your word says if we lift Jesus up, he will draw all men unto him. We plead the blood of Jesus over us tonight as we give out the word on this occult symbols. And we thank you, Lord, that this word will go forth and accomplish what you've purposed it to do. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. This is our third session tonight on symbols. We have in previous sessions talked about different cults, but tonight we're talking about symbols. And we're going to talk about what God has to say about it. And I have some information that actually came off a, a website where they talked about what they sell and what it'll do. And this is first-hand information from people that are involved in the dark side. I want to talk about amulets tonight. Amulets are magic charms worn by people to protect themselves from evil spirits. And this is being taught in our schools in lots of different places right now. And you get into things like Dungeons and Dragons and Harry Potter and different things that cast spells. And you're going to see why God is against having these things. Some of these things you may not even have thought about. But I'd rather go with what God has to say and do what God says and be right with God than to go along with the masses. How about the rest of you? Amen. 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 Amulets are magic charms worn by people to protect themselves from negative energies, evil and injury, and also to bring good luck. Together with other kinds of talismans, amulets are becoming very popular today. They are usually crystals, shelved crosses, or other mystical jewelry worn as a pendant or a necklace or bracelet or hung on a chain dangling from the rear view mirror of automobiles. These so-called sacred stones and other engraved talismans are believed to have mystical powers, which supposedly bring personal protection, success, and prosperity. They are often regarded as transmitters of healing energies and positive vibrations that they're thought to promote feelings of peace and tranquility. From archaeological evidence, we know that amulets were very common in the ancient cultures of the Bible land, especially among pagan peoples. Now, I'm going to share with you some things that God has to say, but also what this individual has put on his website. And if you want to know the website, you can ask me. But God is against these things. I'm going to tell you, God is not in favor of us ever wearing this kind of stuff. Now, there's a website called Exemplar, and I took this right off there. And this is what he talks about symbols. This is what he says, if you use these, will happen. He says, omens, curses, and hexes that foretell the coming of dark forces are rooted in ancient superstition and folklore. And as a result, most of the world's culture rely on various protective symbols to ward off evil and invite the positive forces of the universe. And here are just a few of the most commonly seen magical protection amulets and sacred talismans with information about their historical origins. I'm going to show you this first one here. I think we can all see that. I'll put it up close. This is the evil eye. It looks like a regular eye, doesn't it? But it's an evil eye. And even on our money, there's that eye. The evil eye, this man is saying, is one of the oldest worldwide superstitions. It dates back over 5,000 years before civilizations such as the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians. It was widely believed by the ancients that certain evil or spiteful people could cause sickness and death merely by casting their eye on another person. 
And he's saying, some of the symptoms of an evil eye curse include a headache, a neck ache, and heavy eyelids, and an acute nagging fear or sense of dread. Everything seems to go wrong. Stomach pains with dizziness and nausea. So he's saying on this neck, if you buy one of these that look like this, that this will keep the evil eye will keep those things away from us. And of course, that's superstition. God's word, we'll, we'll go into it a little bit, and you'll hear what God has to say about this. So throughout the years, many have called the evil eye as foolish superstition. However, he says, it continues to influence many people around the world even today. And sometimes people look at you and you think they're doing something bad, or maybe they're just thinking, and sometimes their eye looks at you and you might get the wrong thing. But it's not godly to wear that type of thing around you to keep things away. And we'll talk about scripture that you can use so that you can be protected from any of this stuff. Now another ancient talisman is an arrowhead. Many people wear an arrowhead on a silver chain. This is said to protect the wearer from the illness and guards against the evil eye. Isn't that interesting? But in ancient times, it was believed that sleeping with an arrow that had been pulled from a human body would work as a love charm. Now, isn't that something? You have to go shoot someone with an arrow, kill them, and sleep with an arrow so that you'll have a great relationship in your family. Now, that's against what God would say right there, wouldn't you say? American Indians believed that highly polished arrowheads symbolized male strength. They deflected negative energy, protected from enemies, and absorbed power. They also defended them from death. Now, you know, this all came from that same website. And, of course, here's the arrowheads again, so you can see it. Now, an arrowhead in itself is nothing evil to it, because the Indians use these things. But when you start using it to ward off things that are bad, here's another picture a little bigger. You can see how big that is. This one arrowhead's almost, almost three inches long. That's pretty big. When you're using these things as a amulet to ward off evil spirits, you're not doing what God tells you to do. The next one we're going to talk about is the Italian horn. And I've seen this. This on many, many people. I see women wearing it. I see men wearing it. The Italian horn also is called unicorn's horn, or the leprechaun staff. This S-curved horn amulet was introduced by the Druids. The horn is associated with good luck and good fortune. They say if you wore this, it'll ward off Maluka or the evil eye. Now I'm here to tell you that is superstition. So if you're wearing something like that, I'd get rid of it. Then the next thing is a cat's eye. Now these are gemstones. Here's some pictures of what some of them look like. And I've seen this on jewelry. I've seen it on different things. But people will hang this up around their house or wear it on as a necklace. They say that these gemstones remove obstacles and hindrances from your life. And that they will ward off evil forces of black magic spirits and protect from the evil eye. So if you see that in somebody's yard, you know they're probably in trouble already. The next thing, and this may seem strange to you, is a horseshoe. Some claim that a horseshoe pointed up protects against sorcery, bad luck, and the evil eye. Of course, the best place for a horseshoe is on a horse's hoof, not up on a wall, upside down like this, to protect you. Because the Word of God tells us that the angels of the Lord encamp around about us, and they protect us. Also, the blood of Jesus protects us. All right, the next one we're going to talk about is the eye of Horus, which is the all-seeing eye. There's a picture of it right there. And this one is an ancient symbol, and it was once associated with the occult. He's saying once associated, but it's still associated with it. But he says it's used in modern witchcraft to grant wisdom, prosperity, spiritual protection, and good health. So if you see a necklace or a man or a woman wearing something like this, I would say get rid of it because you're introducing witchcraft. They also says the eye of Horus can also increase clairvoyant powers as well as protect against thieves and the evil eye. I'm telling you folks, all of these things have meanings. 
And the Word of God tells us, my people perish for lack of knowledge. What you don't know does hurt you. I had things in my home years ago that I had to get rid of. I didn't know anything about it because I wasn't taught. And most churches avoid these kind of things because they think, oh, this is just superstition. But I'm telling you, these things open up doors for the enemy to come into your life and cause real problems when you put them on. They're not going to ward off evil spirits. Another one is a four-leaf clover. A lot of people wear this and carry a four-leaf clover for good fortune. It's believed to be one of the most powerful natural amulets. Sacred to the Trinity and used by the Druids as a charm against evil. Four-leaf clovers are said to help the wearer obtain clairvoyant powers. And God says you're not to do that kind of thing. Now there is a gift of the Spirit where people do have discerning of spirits. But God is the one that gives you the information. When you get into clairvoyancy and things like this, it's coming from demonic spirits, familiar spirits. Then there is the Seal of Solomon. Some say the six-pointed star was used as alchemist and was said to have been used by Druid priests as protection against evil ghosts. Then, the next one, some people say sapphires. Some of, the, some of these people in the old cult use these gems to encourage harmony, peace, and contentment. They say, supposedly, that sapphires protect the wearer from misfortune, fraud, enemies, violence, the evil eye, and psychic attacks. Now, this is crazy. A sapphire is just a stone. There's nothing in a sapphire that's going to make that happen. But when you get involved with these things, you do open up a gate if you're wearing it to keep it off. My, I have a birthstone that's a sapphire, and I never look at it as something evil. If it was evil, I wouldn't wear it. But when you use it as an amulet to get rid of these spirits and get into psychic things like that, you're opening a gate. Then there's the snake. A lot of people wear a rattlesnake's rattle to increase wisdom and sexual power. Snake amulets also are said to protect you against the evil eye. Well, I tell you, I'm not going to get close to a rattlesnake to get its rattle. And I would say churches that handle snakes, you really need to be careful because one might just bite you. You're, you're doing presumption against God. The next one I'm going to speak about is a Hamsa, or the Hand of Fatima. There it is right there. You can see what that one looks like. The Hamsa, or Hand of Fatima, supposedly, this website says, depicts an eye centered on an open five-fingered hand. This image is supposedly to attract good luck and helps defend against bad luck. In the Muslim cultures, the hand is made in honor of Fatima the favorite daughter of the prophet Muhammad. Fatima was one of only three women worthy of entering heaven, supposedly from what Muhammad said. But I'm here to tell you that every woman that ever professed Christ and passes away, is they are absent from the body and they're present with the Lord. There's a multitude of women in heaven, and Fatima probably is not one of them. The thumb on this thing represents the prophet himself, and the first finger represents Fatima, the middle finger her husband, and the other symbolizes her two sons. So you can see, wearing this opens a gate. And then, like a pyramid, there's nothing wrong with a pyramid in itself to look at, but some people in the occult wear a, wear a pyramid-shaped amulet to improve work habits, increase energy, improve psychic awareness, and all of these things are things that God says that we're not to do. Pyramid-shaped crystals, they say, will balance emotions and bring wisdom. I'm telling you, I'll tell you what brings wisdom is the Word of God. Proverbs talks about wisdom. If you want to know how to obtain wisdom, you get into the Word of God, because that's the only place you're going to find it. And there's others, the scarab beetle, the scorpion, and then there's the unicorn, folks. The unicorn, these, this amulet, they say, not amulet that you eat, A-M-U-L-E-T, amulet. They're used for chastity and protection and were used to promote fertility and increase sexual magnetism. I'm telling you, if you have unicorns in your house, I would get rid of them. And there's a lot of children's toys that are unicorns. Now you say, what's wrong with it? I can say a toy isn't bad, but when it has another meaning behind it, mythology in it, 
you're opening the door for your child to get involved with other things down the road. So there are some of the things. Then they have some different gemstones. Here's some of them right here. The amber, he says, strengthens the aura, balances the yin and yang, and attracts compassion. And I'm telling you what he says, and we're going to talk a minute about what God has to say. Then there's the garnet that's supposed to also balance that. And the lapis lazuli attracts love. The onyx, wear it, and you're going to have no misfortune. I'm telling you, the only thing I'm going to wear is the blood of Jesus applied to my sin. And my robe of righteousness that he puts on me when I got saved. Now let's see what God has to say about amulets. That's A-M-U-L-E-T, not the egg that you eat, by the way. In Isaiah chapter 2, verse 6. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 6. And when you get there, can I get an amen from you? Our fingers are doing the walking tonight through the scriptures. Isaiah 2 and verse 6. It says, Therefore, Isaiah is prophesying to the house of Israel and to Jacob. O house of Jacob, it says, Therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east and are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves in the children of strangers. And the New International Version says they are full of superstitions from the east. They practice divination like the Philistines and clap hands with pagans. You see, we become like those that we hang out with. You're going to hang out with people in the drugs, eventually you might involve, get involved with drugs. And what happened to the early Israelites is they got involved with the Philistines and others, and they took on their unclean things. He said, you're just like them. And he prophesies against them. And then the Bible further warns us in Isaiah 2, 6, it says, in that day, excuse me, Isaiah 3, 18 through 20, the Bible further warns us, in that day the Lord will take away the beauty of their anklets, headbands, crescent ornaments, dangling earrings, bracelets, veils, headdresses, ankle chains, sashes, perfume boxes, and amulets. That's the New American Standard Bible. All right. God is warning them. Now, am I against jewelry? No. But when you're wearing it as an occult thing or an amulet, like they are to ward off certain things, you're opening the gate for demonic spirits. The King James Version says, In that day the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet, and their calls, C-A-U-L-S, and their round tires like the moon, like the crescent moon. You see, that was a symbol they told them not to have. During the times of apostasy and idolatry, the Israelites co copied the superstitions of the pagan people around them, including the practice of wearing amulets and magic charms. God issued a stern warning to the false prophetesses of Israel who wore the amulets. This is what the Sovereign Lord says in Ezekiel. Woe to the woman who sew magic charms on all their wrists and make veils of various lengths for their heads in order to ensnare people. Will you ensnare the lives of my people but preserve your own? I am against your magic charms with which you ensnare people like birds, and I will tear them from your arms. I will set free the people that you ensnare like birds. I will tear off your veils and save my people from your hands, and they will no longer fall prey to your power. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? That comes from Ezekiel 13, 18, 9, 20, and 21. That's a new international version. Now, the King James reads a little bit different, but when you study, you can use more than one interpretation. The King James says, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the women that sew pillows to all your armholes, and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. Will you hunt the souls of my people? Will you save the souls alive that come unto you? Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I'm against your pillows, Wherewith you there hunt the souls to make them fly. 
and I will tear them from your arms, and will let the souls go, even the souls that you hunt to make them fly. Our kerchiefs also will I tear, and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted, and you shall know that I am the Lord. You see, God was saying they were wearing all these things from superstitious things, all these amulets. Maybe not exactly the pictures I've shown you, but similar things. They picked up these customs to, from the pagans, and they took on their lifestyle. When we hang out with people that are doing it, we certainly are going to become like they are. In the name of Jesus, I'd say, take all of those things off. Now, in addition to wearing amulets, pagan peoples also possess larger talismans called teraphim or household idols made in the shape of ancient, ancient ancestors. These miniature images were kept in the home and would be taken along on journeys. The use of these figurines infiltrated Israel, and God was opposed to them. Let's hear what God has to say about idols or statues in your home. I may step on some toes here, but when you start worshiping an idol or a statue, you are in dangerous ground. It says, moreover, Josiah removed the mediums and the spirits and the teraphim and the idols and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, that he might confirm the words of the Lord, of the law, which were written in the book. That comes from 2 Kings 23, 24. The King James says, moreover, the workers with familiar spirits. And see, that's what happens when you get into these things unclean spirits will come in you. You may wonder why you're struggling or why things aren't going right. Well, it's not because the amulet's keeping it off. It's because you wear these things and they're ungodly and they open the gate. Moreover, the workers with familiar spirits and the wizards and the images and the idols and all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah and Jerusalem did Josiah put away that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. You see, the word of God had been shut up for a while in that day. And young Josiah went and he found the books of the Lord. He found out what God had to say about these things. God says in Hebrews that he that seeketh God, you come and you're, you'll be rewarded. He's rewarded them that diligently seek him. So Josiah had found the word of God he found out that these things were not things to be had in their country, so he got rid of them. Praise God for a young king that got rid of the garbage that was there. Whenever amulets, idols, or other magic charms are mentioned in the Bible, God's attitude is against them and those who trust in them. In Psalm 31, verse 6, it says, I have hated those who regard useless idols but I trust in the Lord. Wow. Then the King James says, I have hated them that regard lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord. Folks, when you have things in your home and you worship the idol and you think that's a God, you're in trouble. You shouldn't pray to idols. You shouldn't pray to idols in a church. And if you're in a church where they have statues and you pray to them, I would pray that you would get set free and get out of that because God is not pleased when there's idolatry. I don't care who the statue is. That's even why when I see the cross, I don't even want to see Jesus on it because he's no longer on the cross, people. He's risen from the dead. When we feel the need for divine protection to guard us against physical harm or danger, we should trust God, not some magic amulet or charm. In fact, Psalm 91 says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Wow, what a tremendous promise. I remember I lived in the west coast of Florida, and a hurricane was coming in. 
And I went into the Word, and the Lord used the snare of the Fowler. And I just happened to have a business on a street called Fowler Street. And God spoke to me and said there was not going to be any problems. And the hurricane came and went right back out to sea. Praise God. We can trust in the Lord with these things. If we need a protection from evil and demonic powers, God has something better to offer than amulets and useless figurines. He tells us in Ephesians 6 to put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Stand firm then with a belt of truth buckled around your waist, with a breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with a readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. He is the only peace. You're not going to get peace from more of these things. In addition, it says in Ephesians, to, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. When we put on the armor of God, we don't have to worry because God's armor is going to see us through. Now, I'm going to go into a little further on one more thing tonight because we have some time. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the yin and the yang. And some of you may wear these things and some of you may not. But I want you to be taught about it. Because I did not know these things. There's two sheets in each thing. If you'll pass those around. Take them apart. All right. Here's what the yin and the yang look like. And that looks like light and dark, doesn't it? Some would say a light side and a dark side. But I want to teach you tonight a little bit about the yin and the yang. And this information comes from somebody that years ago had been involved in black magic, involved in the occult very, very deeply. And when she got out of it and got saved, she was determined to teach the truth. And we see the yin and the yang everywhere. Like I said, there's the picture of it right there. How many in this room have seen it before? Anybody? All right. It's everywhere. The classic yin-yang symbol, seen more and more these days, is a circular symbol, half black and half white, with a small dot of white on the black side and a small black dot on the white side. This symbol is called the Tai Chi Tu. The term yin-yang is drifting into popular speech, also usually along such lines as this. Well, everything has its yin and yang side, Many believe this symbol represents balance, peace, or harmony. Others believe that it means there's a little bad in the good and a little good in the bad, which would mean there's no absolute good or evil. Now, where did yin-yang really come from, and what does it mean? The origins of yin-yang became associated with Taoism, which is a religion that was widespread in China several hundred years before Christ's incarnation on earth. In Taoism, the Tao, loosely translated as the way or the path, is the origin of all things and the ultimate reality. That's what they teach. As is true in many Eastern religions, this concept is not to be grasped intellectually since it describes a reality beyond the intellect. Therefore, according to the Tao's teaching, the truth of the Tao, T-A-O, can only be understood indirectly or through a process of enlightened living. They say that happiness is gained by living in the flow of the title, which in the flow of the universe, which is the flow of the universe they teach. This belief has no personal God. Where do the yin and yang come in? Through the dynamics of yin and yang, the female and male cosmic principles, the Tao creates all phenomena. Whereas the Tao is perfectly harmonious, the cosmos is in a state of constant disequilibrium. That comes from Spirituality by the Numbers by George Fernstein, page 146. Now, the forces behind yin yang arise from a belief in dualism, which is a state in which the universe is seemingly equal divided into two opposing but equal forces. 
This is what they teach. The dualistic world of yin-yang, however, is not seen as good versus bad. In yin-yang, it's divided along other lines. Yang, represented by the white and the yin-yang symbol, stands for the creative principle, while yin, represented by black, is dissolution and return to creation. Yang came to represent hot, dry, male, light, hardness, movement, and initiative. Yin symbolizes coolness, moistness, female, darkness, softness, stillness, and receptivity. The yin and yang forces are believed to be cyclical, moving and evolving into each other, represented by the white dot on the black yin side of the symbol and by the black dot in the white yang side. In this review, the universe depend, excuse me, in this view, the universe depends upon the interaction between these two forces which arise from the tail. That's what they believe. Yin and yang also became a part of the I Ching, a form of divination. Now that's occult, and God tells us not to have divination. These values extend to a classification of foods and organs in the body, plants, etc., as either yin or yang. The macrobiotic diet first popular in the late 60s and the 70s, is based on the division of food into their yin and yang properties. <coughs> the way to be content, they say, is to balance between these two forces and thus find harmony in the title. If the yin-yang forces in the body get unbalanced, then illness results, they say. Now, in yin-yang, they say there's no good or bad. They teach there's really no good or bad according to the Taoist yin-yang view, only what appears to be good or bad. There is no life and death in yin-yang because life and death are one. Right and wrong are the same. This came from the Chuang Tzu as quoted in World Religions by Jeffrey Perinder on page 333. That's a direct quote about yin-yang. In this view, opposites are not really opposite. They just appear that way to us because we perceive through a dualistic conditioning and cannot see how opposites are really part of the whole. They teach that opposites actually contain the essence of each other and eventually merge with each other. This is one of the origins of the holistic view of the world and of the body and remains a basic inner plane, including every person, animal, rock, tree, river, etc., through the yin-yang inter interaction. Referring to the Tao, Wen Tzu states that the way has no front or back, no left or right. All things are mysteriously the same, with no right and wrong. That comes from his teaching called Further Teachings of Lao Tzu, Boston, Shambhala, 1992. Then let's speak about holism. Many people mistakenly accept the body-mind connection of holism because we know that our attitudes often affect our health or recovery from illness. However, attitudes in the contemporary and mystical holistic view are two separate things. The holistic view of the body of health is based in monoism, monism, that all is one and one is all, and that a universal force, referred to as the chai or the ki, qi, connects us and flows to the body. Holism today assumes that all illness is an imbalance of or blockage of the chai and or the yin-yang forces in the body, and thus the state of one's health is a reflection of this energy, spiritual imbalance or blockage. Now, what do they have to say about acupuncture? Most holistic healers believe that illness is a spiritual condition and they use methods based in occultism and Eastern religious views. They say acupuncture originates in the belief that the yin-yang forces flow along invisible pathways in the body called meridians, and that illness results from an imbalance in these forces, or the blockage of these forces. They say that by inserting needles at certain points, it's supposed to allow a balanced flow of the body's yin and yang energies. Although there are theories that acupuncture works, either because the placements of the needles send signals to the brain, which release endorphins, or because the, the, if the, or because the needles block a pain signal in the brain, these theories have not been proven. Even if these theories prove correct, then the conclusion would be that it's not acupuncture that is working. 
since acupuncture is based on the idea that relief is coming from the flowing of chai and balancing of yin yang. What would be working is relief of pain through endorphins and the blockage of pain signals. This is not the theory of traditional acupuncture. This relief would have nothing to do with chai, meridians, or yin and yang, but rather with biology and a proper understanding of the body. At best, acupuncture relieves limited amounts of pain temporarily. No physical or medical model exists yet to explain acupuncture. Now let's see what the Word of God has to say about yin-yang. First of all, evil is not a force. If opposites are always merging into and becoming each other, then there's no absolute good or evil. But in 1 John 1, 5, it states, This is the message we've heard from him and declare in you. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Evil is not a force. It is a rejection or rebellion against the good. Evil is the work of Satan, who has no truth in him, and those who choose to deny or reject God. In John 8, 44, it says, You, those that deny or reject God, are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. So evil is not a force. And there's many, many movies out there that talk about the force. So we need to be careful. Children get involved with these, and they get involved in these other Eastern religions because of that. Then, let's say this. They teach that evil and good are equal, but God says they're not equal because God is sovereign. In 1 John 3, 8, it states, He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So God came to destroy the works of the devil. Evil and good are not equal. They're opposites. Now, God allows Satan to operate for now. But Satan was defeated when Jesus died for us on the cross, allowing deliverance from Satan's power through trusting Christ. In Colossians 1, 13 and 14, it says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire. Revelations 20, 10 says, and the devil that deceived them, see, all this stuff is deception, telling you that you can have these powers and it'll keep all these things away from you. And by wearing this, you're going to be in harmony. But it says the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now let's talk about the QI, the Chi. Pai Chai often called a moving meditation, is based in Taoism. One of the purposes of Tai Chi is to facilitate the flow of Kai through the body. Harper's Encyclopedia of Mystical and Paranormal Experience, Rosemary Ellen Guiley, wrote that. That's what they teach. The Kai, also spelled Chai, Kai, or Jai, is an Eastern name for the universal energy supposedly flowing through the body. A fact sheet on the meaning of the 108 moves in Tai Chi put out by the Taos Tai Chi Society in the United States states that the 36 major and minor yang channels in the body are celestial deities, while the yin elements in the body are 72 terrestrial deities. The combined total is 108, a number divined by Chang Sen Feng himself. He was a 11th century Taos monk and he was considered the founder of Tai Chi. The statement goes on to say that the full 108 symbolizes the harmonious balance of yin and yang and therefore lead to health. The union of all yin and yang elements represent the return to holistic and undifferentiated state of the title. The term undifferentiated means there are no distinctions, means all is one. How should a Christian respond to these things? These things we've been talking about tonight, the amulets, the things we wear, the yin-yang, the, the, 
the Italian horn, olives, Christians, should be discerning about practices such as acupuncture that have yet has no medical basis, and exercises like Tai Chi that are designed based on spiritual beliefs hostile to Christ's claim. They say this leads you into enlightenment and the truth. But Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, that he was the way, he was the truth, and he was the life. The fact that such a treatment may work is not a good enough reason for using it. Many things in the occult and mystical world seem to work. The standard for Christians in adopting a spiritual-based idea or practice is not whether it works. We are admonished in 1 John 4.1 says, do not believe every spirit, but test or try the spirits to see whether they are from God. These words should be taken to heart in regards to many other holistic and alternative treatments as well. The tile claims to be the way, but offers an undifferentiated whole where there are ultimately no distinguishes between yin and yang, or between good and evil. They say harmony is based on balance and yin and yang. And however, true peace comes only through trusting Christ. That comes from John chapter 14, verse 27, and Philippians 4, 7. Let's turn there. John chapter 14. Maybe you can share there. John chapter 14. It says... In verse 27, we're speaking right now about peace. It says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. People are looking for peace through all these things they wear, through all these different things that we've discussed tonight. But there's no peace outside of Jesus Christ. And let's turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Are you with me tonight? Give me an amen. Amen. Philippians chapter 4 and we'll read verse 7. Well, let's start with verse 6. It says, be careful or don't worry for nothing. But in everything, everything everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God and when you do it verse 7 says and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus so we're not to worry about things we're to pray about things there is a person Jesus not a principle or a philosophy who said he is the way in John 14, 6. The way to God and to eternal life. And if you don't know Jesus tonight, and you're involved in some of these things, and you've been enlightened, you've seen the truth, you've heard the truth tonight, I would ask that you come out of this, and that you turn your life around to Jesus Christ. I would say if you're worshiping idols, or you have things on your wall that are idols, or you're wearing jewelry, it's time to get it out of your house. These things cause problems in your house. And I don't even go so far to say if you have pictures of rock stars and things like that in your house and you worship these people as if they're a god, get rid of them. I knew of a situation. A young girl was so sick and they couldn't control what was going on. She'd gotten very, very angry and just threw fits. And they asked the pastor to come to the house and pray for her. And when he came in, there was a life-size picture of Elvis Presley. Now, there's nothing wrong with Elvis Presley. But this girl worshipped him, and it became an idol in the house. And through discerning of spirits, the pastor told the parents, you need to get rid of that. This girl is not going after Jesus Christ. She's not going after God. This has become an idol in her life. And when they took that out of the house and the girl repented, she got well. We need to clean our house, so to speak. Get rid of things that are not pleasing to God. And until next week, when we continue our study, I would say may God bless you and reveal his power to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.